Canto 29 of The Paradise begins with one of these extraordinary astronomical visions, almost, of Dante, when he describes the sky and the heavens from an Earth point of view in order to communicate something to us which is going to be crucial in the canto. This vision catch the, catches the moment when, I think at the vernal equinox it is, the sun is just rising on one side of the sky as the full moon is just setting on the opposite horizon. And Dante describes that moment as the light is changing, you might say, as the day is being born from the night. And he describes that moment as like a crown. He notices that um, the sun will be crowned by the constellation of Aries, the moon on the opposite horizon will be crowned by the constellation of Libra. He's drawing in the heaven of the fixed stars here, as well as the children of Latona, as he puts it, Apollo and Diana, the sun and the moon. And he notices that at the pinnacle of this great circumference with the stars, like the jewels in the crown, there is the zenith. There is the point at which it's all held together. And that zenith, Beatrice is looking at, as Dante, the poet, gives us this vision, Dante the Pilgrim sees Beatrice staring at this point of infinite density that is the source of everything, this dimensionless source, ever-present origin, that is the divine light. So to this earth-centric hemisphere that's like a crown marked by the sunrise and the moonset and the stars in the heavens, Beatrice adds a second inverted hemisphere now, which is the one that Dante has seen in Canto 28, with the divine centre that is all at once, everywhere and every when too, as Beatrice puts it now. There's the temporal hemisphere and the eternal hemisphere interlocking as Dante sees them now. And some commentators have noticed that there's a, a chiasmus in these first 12 opening lines of Canto 29, because the middle word in the 12 lines is the word hemisphere. And the 12 lines begin and end with the same sound, so creating a poetic mirroring of what Dante is describing, which is a vision of how the eternal and temporal aren't ultimately equal and opposites. They're not even complementary so much as fully intertwined. The eternal can be experienced in the temporal quite as much as the eternal holds the temporal too. There's this hypersphere as modern readers of Dante have sometimes found, the sense that the visible universe that we know is held and contained and interwoven with an invisible hemisphere, invisible universe. Um, in post-Einsteinian physics, where the idea of the hypersphere really comes into its own, it's how the spatial world is interlocked with the temporal world, and hence there's the notion of space-time. But what Dante is seeing here is not just an account of physics, but an account of metaphysics too, which sees the eternal and the temporal as participating in each other. That is the tremendousness of the vision that Dante portrays. And there's something else too, because he describes Beatrice looking at the everywhere and the every when, this point of no dimension that eternally holds all things in present mindedness. Um, he describes Beatrice looking at this point just for the moment when the sun is just edging over the horizon, the moon is just slipping below the horizon. There's a moment of balance. And I think that that moment of balance captures 
the sense for us even of how on occasion in our mind's eye we might see that vision where the eternal and the temporal are actually part and parcel of the same perfection. It's like we can hover in that moment, even if it's just an instance, but feel the full force of not just two hemispheres, but the complete circle of reality. And you might even go further, as occasionally commentators have done, and think that if this is a complete circle, which Dante is envisaging now, which he's seeing for himself in Beatrice's stare at the point in these high, high heavens, in the prima mobile. This is also a vision of how, from the anagogic point of view, after the transformation to the sense of things being seen subspecie eternitatis, from God's point of view, which is what we get in these glimpses of eternity and temporality being balanced. From that point of view, nothing is lost. This is the Christianity beyond Christianity that has gradually been unfolding in Dante's mind. This is the universalism in which everything is gathered together, much as the sphere holds everything together completely. And as this canto unfolds, I think we get a sense of that because this canto is concerned with creation, with how the temporal and the eternal relate. And as you read it a few times, you get the sense that from this high point of the beginning, the anagogic view, Dante almost falls down through the allegorical and the literal as he goes through a kind of sweep of creation, both as it was made and then as it fell out, before returning at the end to the anagogic view once more. In fact, at the end, Beatrice describes the canto as a digression. It's a digression in many ways. Um, literally, it's a digression from the divine view that her and Dante had been drawing at the beginning of the canto. Um, it's allegorically a digression because it shows how things can seemingly fall away from the divine in the fall of Lucifer and in the fall of human beings as well, which it will cover. But it also contains this tropological sense that actually that fall is itself a digression from the completeness, which actually never changed throughout. So in a strange kind of way, the mysterious way, this canto brings together the old Christian account of the fall, but sees it within the anagogic view that never changed. And so in a way, it's almost like the fall never happened, though it did. Because it's seen by the end, I think, as a kind of digression from the perfect view that Beatrice and Dante are enjoying at these points in the paradise as we, of course, near the end and completeness of the vision. I think you can only understand the fall as digression and this divine point of view when the focus is on the incarnation, the incarnation being the temporal mirroring of the divine moment of creation, the incarnation bringing the temporal and eternal together as the temporal awakens to its capacity to give birth to the eternal, to incarnate it, which is to say it was there a capacity all along. And the language of potential being actualized is going to be used as now the canto moves into an account of creation and return. Beatrice says to Dante that she knows with divine telepathy that he longs to understand how this vision that he's glimpsed actually comes together, how the eternal and temporal intimately relate. And she begins by saying that the creation didn't come about to increase the divine goodness. The divine goodness is already infinite but it came about in order that that divine goodness might declare itself, might say, I am. I am being the divine name heard in temporality. Um, it's a, a name that links the two together. And we feel that in ourselves. If you 
ask who is this I that is having all these experiences that is born into creation um, that can say I am. That is sometimes said to be um, the um, quick path to enlightenment even when you realize that your I-ness can only know itself as an I-ness when it shares in the divine awareness too. I think Beatrice is alluding to what is now often called the non-dual sense of things. Um, I also like these analogies from the mathematics of infinity. And the odd thing about infinity is you, if you have one infinite set, um, which really is infinite, there's always another infinity to be found within it. Um, say the infinite set of odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on. Within that infinity can be found another infinity, the infinity of even numbers, two, four, six, eight. And the strange thing is that those two infinities come together to make an infinity that was there all along, the infinity of natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. When you use these analogies, it takes you to that moment of glimpsing the fullness of the truth that Beatrice and Dante are now sharing, though they, as it were, almost fall from that anagogic view to see creation from the perspective that we often feel we see it. Um, but I, I think through the counter, never quite losing contact with that anagogic point of view. So, for example, creation is described as having no beginning from the divine point of view, though we will talk of the beginning of all things. Um, and she'll talk about how in this instant of manifestation, creation simultaneously was born with the three levels of, as she puts it, um, pure potential, which is the world in which we live in, um, a mix of potential and the actual, which is the levels of the heavens that they've traveled through, the heavens of um, the moon through to Saturn. And then also the creation of pure actuality, which is what they're seeing from the prima mobile in the world of the angels um, that is always already fully formed in its love of the divine, as opposed to creation as we know it um, in potential or this mix of potential and actual, um, which is creation fully formed in its capacity to love the divine. And so always already on the journey back to the divine. Um, if you like, the angels never left it, but in this universal vision, we were always already returning to it. And she describes how these three levels of things were shot as if from a three-strung um, bow that could fire three arrows all at once. Um, it's an image of the Trinity, and uh, much as the threeness of the Trinity and the divine make for the oneness of the divinity, in fact. So she's saying that the three levels of creation, um, the potential, the potential actual mix and the actualized in the angels, that too is a threeness that from this anagogic point of view always makes for a oneness if it can be seen with this visionary glimpse from this non-dual perspective. That said, in the world of potential, before it knows of itself as returning, mistakes can be made, errors of understanding can be made. They're not fatal, I don't think, because reflected light is always still the divine light, even if it's only reflected in a moment. Um, this is something which Dante has said before and will be said again too. Um, there is no ultimate loss of goodness, of being, even, I think, in the depths of the inferno. This is why Lucifer, the creature of light, is still moving just. That even faint movement is still divine movement. And so even Lucifer, I think, this canto is saying, didn't fully lose contact with the divine. The mistake which um, first comes up in the canto is actually um, a mistake which Dante says Jerome made and one of the early great commentators on the Bible in the West um, when he had said that the angels spent time enjoying their creation before the world was made 
and there was a gap as it were between the creation of the high heavens and the creation of the earth and Dante says that no that that can't be when you understand it from the anagogic point of view because all things are always already completely interrelated um, the angels couldn't as it were have been giving form to all things with their divine intelligence when there was nothing to give form to the angelic life and the temporal life is always interconnected she then moves on to describe the fall, but seen from this anagogic point of view, she says that very soon, before you could count to 20, after the angels were created, um, Satan, Lucifer, um, and the other fallen angels, in their presumption, tumbled to the low point where Dante had met Lucifer in the Inferno. But it's described in an interesting way. Um, it's said that there he's crushed by the weight of the universe. Rather than rejoicing and dancing in the light of the universe, that is what it is to feel fallen. It's to lose touch with the I amness within you that you realize is sharing in the divine life and light, the divine I am. And when you lose touch with that and instead become identified, say, with yourself as a separate being, as Lucifer had done in his presumptuousness. Remember, Virgil had explained down in the depths of the inferno that Lucifer had just momentarily raised an eyebrow to the divine as if he was going to seize what he had been given in creation. In that moment is to become separate from the rejoicing of connection and interpenetration, which most of the angels did not, because then Beatrice describes how they, in their moment of creation, realised that not just their goodness and intelligence was the gift of God, but that also knowing that goodness and intelligence to its infinity was about being open to the life of God. Um, it was a to and a fro from God to them, given back to the divine. That's what it's like as a creature to share in the uncreated, to rest in that sense of life, which is both yours fully to enjoy and know, but to fully and enjoy and know that it's shared with all things and comes from this dimensionless point of light with which the canto had began. Most of the angels, the angels they're seeing now here in the Prima Mobile, moving in their separate circles, in their, their blizzard of light, um, the infinite number of them, um, which Beatrice emphasises again now, as she has done in the previous canto. Um, that is what they know and have remained steadfast to, which leads her to correct another bit of mistaken angelology. Because she says that some people on earth in the potential realm have lost this sense of eternal sight. And so think that angels, have argued that angels, don't just have understanding and will. So understanding is the vision they see of the divine in its completeness. And will is their desire to have that understanding. Um, some on earth, Beatrice points out, have argued that the angels have memory too. But she says this can't be, because the minute you have memory, you feel as if you're existing in time. There's a before to have memories of, and a present to try and hold on to those memories, and a future where you fear those memories might be lost. That is to lose the anagogic perspective. It's to forget that your I amness rests in the eternal I am, and to become identified well, in the non-dual sense, they would say to become identified with your experiences rather than with the experiencer itself. So Beatrice explains to Dante that angels can't have memory. Um, and this is not just a strange bit of esoterica. It's to remind us for ourselves, too, that in our destiny, which is also our origin, and also in this anagogic perspective, our present truest state, we have no memory too. You might say that what we think of as our memories are illusions. Um, in a sense, 
they're true because they do make us feel like we're living in a world of memory of time of past present and future but ultimately they're untrue when seen from the divine point of view within us Beatrice then moves on to describe um, further mistakes um, with a bit more ferocity. Um, there can be real condemnation of the ways of the church in heaven, as we've seen already. And Beatrice now moves to describe two things, really. One is how theologians, preachers, philosophers can get so caught up in reason that they become... Um, sophistical. They love the arguments so much that they enjoy the arguments for their own sake and in the life of that pleasure think that they're experiencing the divine life when what they've lost is how reason is only true when it serves the vision that's beyond reason, when it serves to point and illuminate us to the divine. And that's one mistake which she says people on earth um, are making. Um, another mistake, she says, is when they think that they can somehow prove the divine point of view from the material aspect. Um, this is the tendency of spiritual materialism. And she gives um, a tangible example when she says that um, when people try to explain the light dimming at the moment of Christ's death, when they try to explain that dimming as an eclipse of the sun, they're completely mistaking what they're actually seeing. What they were seeing was a dimming of the divine light across the whole of creation um, in order to understand how that very diminution can be returned to the fullness of the divine light. Um, but you lose that sense of return when you try to explain it as a more humdrum kind of eclipse. You know, you get the same thing happening today all over the place where people try to explain the Bethlehem star as if it might have been a comet. Or they try to explain the resurrection by using the biblical counts as evidence that might stand up in court. In engaging in that very process of explanation, you've already lost the divine point of view by trying to understand things from within the wrong domain, from within the domain of past, present and future, from within the domain of the only potential. It's such a disaster, not just because trying to prove Christianity never works, but just leaves you feeling sort of shoved and cajoled either by reason or by evidence. Um, but that very shoving and cajoling lead, um, prevents you, you might say, from being drawn by life itself. And it's already cut you off from the very perspective that you need, which is this divine perspective, the capacity to see all things in the round, gathered together, never actually having been lost when understood from the eternal point of view. That is the incarnation continuing throughout all creation, the creative moment itself being made manifest in this ongoing eternal way, um, when the eternal point of view and the temporal point of view come together so the temporal knows itself as but another joyful manifestation of the eternal. Beatrice continues with her condemnation and she really does quite ferociously lay into people that peddle the gospel either through proof or through self-satisfied reason. She says actually they're devilish and they're sharing in the fullness of the fall. Um, I mean, I do agree with her in the sense that I think this is the profound mistake that so many in Christianity are making now. It's why Christianity has to move beyond itself, not just to see the universalism of all things from the divine point of view, but to regain the capacity for divine sight rather than trying to force people to believe in the gospel, force people somehow to believe in Jesus, force people um, to exclude other points of view as if only the Christian way is right. It's got to be exactly the opposite so that we can see in this marvellous vision how actually all things have their core of truth because any light, any voice, any word can only be 
an echo or reflection of the voice, light and word of this divine dimensionless source and ever-present origin. When you can see that, you've already known that you're always eternal already. And so, nearing the end of the canto, Beatrice says, look, enough of this digression. Enough of not trying to explain things literally, not even really trying to give a moral account of how people make mistakes, but enough of this mere digression back to the eternal view. Um, and the canto ends with a beautiful expression of the eternal view. Beatrice and Dante are looking from the prima mobile into the spiritual heaven of the Imperium, into the eternal hemisphere that with the temporal hemisphere makes a complete sense of all things. And I'd just like to read the lines actually as translated by Mark Muser that ends the canto because it explains it very beautifully and well. When Mark Muser says, you see the breadth of eternal goodness, which divides itself into these countless mirrors that reflect itself remaining one as it always was. So that division is itself an expression of the oneness as it always was, much as when a shaft of life comes through a window, catches a crystal and blazes in a dazzle of rainbow light all around the room, that dazzle of rainbow light is always already an expression of the shaft of life from whence it came. 